Welcome to another case presentation in the Refer Wisely campaign series. I am Raymond Russell, Associate Professor of Medicine at the Warren Albert Medical School of Brown University, and I will discuss the application of appropriate use criteria in the evaluation of a new left bundle branch block. The patient is a 71-year-old man who presented to his internist for routine annual checkup. Of significance to our discussion, the patient's prior electrocardiogram demonstrates normal sinus rhythm with no evidence of any interventricular conduction delay, including left bundle branch block. The patient denies the presence of any chest pain, but does report decreased exercise capacity. The patient's past medical history is significant for the presence of the cardiac risk factors of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and a remote history of tobacco use. He has no history of coronary artery disease or diabetes mellitus. His hypertension is currently under control with hydrochlorothiazide, and he is on atorvastatin for his hyperlipidemia. The electrocardiogram obtained at the current office visit demonstrates sinus rhythm with left bundle branch block. As noted previously, the electrocardiogram from the patient's checkup last year did not show left bundle branch block. Therefore, the left bundle branch block should be considered as new onset and brings up the question, what further diagnostic studies should be performed to evaluate the conduction abnormality? The 2013 multimodality appropriate use criteria for the detection and risk assessment of stable ischemic heart disease were developed to determine the appropriateness of different imaging modalities in 80 clinical scenarios. Exercise electrocardiography, stress radionuclide imaging, stress echocardiography, stress cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, coronary calcium scoring, coronary CT angiography, and invasive angiography are rated as appropriate, may be appropriate, or rarely appropriate in each of these clinical scenarios. As I will discuss shortly, the presence of a new left bundle branch block may be due to ischemic heart disease. As is shown in this table from the 2013 paper, for patients with a new left bundle branch block and a low, intermediate, or high global CAD risk, the utilization of cardiac imaging can be appropriate in the evaluation. Specifically, both stress radionuclide imaging and stress echocardiography are appropriate for the detection of ischemic heart disease. Stress cardiac magnetic resonance imaging and coronary CT angiography receive appropriate or may be appropriate levels depending on the pretest CAD risk. Invasive coronary angiography may be appropriate, but only in patients at intermediate to high global CAD risk. In contrast, calcium scoring is rarely appropriate for the evaluation of a new left bundle branch block. Before we turn to the workup of our patient, I wanted to review some important facts about left bundle branch block and the implications of the presence of left bundle branch block on test selection. Left bundle branch block is present in 0.1 to 0.8% of the general population and can be associated with a variety of cardiovascular diseases, including coronary artery disease, hypertension, and cardiomegaly. It is important to determine if there is an ischemic etiology for a new left bundle branch block because those individuals with left bundle branch block and coronary artery disease have a poorer prognosis than those with left bundle branch block but no coronary artery disease. In addition to ischemic heart disease, left bundle branch block can occur simply due to senile degeneration of the conduction system. It also occurs as a result of ventricular pacing and as a result of the presence of cardiomyopathy. In general, we try to have the patient exercise, if at all possible, for both radionuclide and echocardiographic stress testing. However, we make an exception for those individuals with a left bundle branch block for two reasons. First, it is difficult to detect ischemic ECG changes in the presence of the repolarization abnormalities that are a part of left bundle branch block. Second, there are perfusion and wall motion abnormalities with left bundle branch block that can be accentuated with increases in heart rate as can occur with exercise or the use of dobutamine for stress imaging. As a result, cardiologists will generally perform vasodilator stress tests with adenosine, regadenosine, or diphoretamol 
in conjunction with radionuclide imaging in patients with left bundle branch block. Returning to our patient, he underwent a pharmacologic stress test to avoid the artifacts that can be seen with exercise. As can commonly occur with the vasodilator stress test, he developed transient chest pain but remained hemodynamically stable. Electrocardiographic monitoring during the stress test demonstrated the continued presence of his left bundle branch block. The results of his radionuclide myocardial perfusion study are shown in these images. The stress and rest images are shown in the short axis on the top panels, the vertical long axis in the middle panels, and the horizontal long axis at the bottom. Visual and quantitative interpretation of the images revealed no perfusion abnormalities, and the left ventricular ejection fraction was normal. The study was therefore reported out as a normal study. The patient subsequently underwent echocardiography to exclude cardiac structural abnormalities as a cause of his left bundle branch block. No further cardiac evaluation is warranted at this time, and he will continue his hydrochlorothiazide in a torvastat. In summary, both nuclear stress perfusion imaging and stress echocardiography are appropriate for the evaluation of a new left bundle branch block under the appropriate use criteria. Coronary CT angiography may be appropriate for the evaluation of a new left bundle branch block. Because of heart rate-related artifacts, the use of pharmacologic stress testing with adenosin, regadenosin, or dipredomol can reduce artifacts in stress imaging in patients with an underlying left bundle branch block. Thank you. Hi, this is Andrea Medina. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of General Internal Medicine at the University of Oklahoma in Oklahoma City. I'm an academic internist. I spend time in the inpatient setting and the outpatient setting, and I want to discuss this patient with you from the perspective of an outpatient primary care physician. So in the outpatient setting, this patient might be familiar to you. He has hypertension and hyperlipidemia. He has no known coronary artery disease, and he comes to you for just routine yearly checkup. He's reporting no chest pressure, but he does have this decreased exercise intolerance, and because of this, you get an EKG. I'd like to point out, though, that this could just as easily be a patient who comes to you maybe after visiting an urgent care clinic and got an EKG or got an EKG from another office, and they said, talk to your primary care doctor about this. So one way or another, you now have a patient with no known coronary artery disease and an EKG with a not old left bundle branch block, and again, not symptomatic with chest pain. So what do you do? You, you can't ignore a new left bundle branch block. And like Dr. Russell said, we know that left bundle branch blocks can occur in patients with underlying heart disease or patients, and patients with left bundle branch block are more likely to have coronary artery disease. It's also found in asymptomatic patients with structurally normal hearts. Uh, and as he pointed out, it's sometimes difficult to know what to do because a left bundle branch block can make interpreting a stress test complicated. So in thinking what to do next, we can look at slide six, and you can see the AUC indication for testing a patient where there is an abnormal EKG finding, like a left bundle branch block, um, who's either low global risk or intermediate to high risk, and in a patient who could uh, exercise. So we've just reviewed this again, but it'd be appropriate to order stress testing, so either exercise, dobutamine, or vasodilator pharmacologic stress testing. But, but like we've said, that left bundle branch block um, can, can make an exercise or dobutamine stress test uh, difficult to interpret. So those really aren't ideal because the potential for artifact. So in the case of a left bundle branch block, you know, pharmacologic vasodilator stress test like we did would be the preferred choice. So this patient's stress testing was normal, showed no ischemia, there's no evidence of um, coronary artery disease by, by the stress testing. And so because of the potential for some underlying structural abnormality, a 2D uh, transthoracic echocardiogram was then done to look for structural disease, and that was also normal. So at that point, you don't need any more cardiac workup. He has a left bundle branch block, there's no ischemia on stress testing, and there's no underlying structural heart disease, you would continue to treat him medically with 
his medication for hypertension, hyperlipidemia, trying to control those those risk factors and reduce those as part of his uh, long-term risk for developing coronary artery disease. The other thing that, that I want to note on this case is that when he was getting the stress test and he um, got the infusion of the vasodilator agent, he had chest pressure. And so, um, Dr. Russell, could you comment a little on that? Dr. Medina, thank you very much. Uh, the development of chest pain during a pharmacologic stress test is fairly common, and it has to do with the fact that the receptors in the coronary vasculature that are responsible for vasodilation in response to those pharmacologic agents can also cause the development of chest pain, and therefore it is a fairly common finding for patients that are receiving any of those three agents, adenosine, regadenosine, or dipritamol, to develop chest pain. However, it has no clinical implications. Okay, thank you. That clears that up. I think sometimes we might, anytime we hear chest pressure, we, we our ears peak and, and we uh, get a little worried, so that's good to know. Thank you.